Well, evidence from all across Europe suggests that the health care system accounts for perhaps 10 percent of the health of the population. The other 90 percent relates to what I call the social determinants of health. So in other words, we need universal access to health care when we get sick. Everybody needs that. But it's not lack of health care that determines inequalities in health in the first place. How and when, when we look, sorry, well, please carry on. We, when we look at what's happened with COVID-19, it's been unfortunately entirely predictable. Firstly, when we look at deprivation, what we see is the more deprived the area in which people live, the higher the mortality from COVID-19. And that excess is pretty parallel to the excess from all causes. In other words, the inequalities in health that we've seen for a very long time before the pandemic look very similar to the inequalities we see with the pandemic. And then when we turn our attention to black, Asian, minority ethnic groups and look at the excess mortality from COVID-19 in black British, it's about a twofold excess. But most of that excess can be accounted for by deprivation the fact that black British are more likely to live in deprived areas. As you look at the factors that contribute to this uh, lack of equity in outcomes, is it basically about the difference in education and public policy that directs information to those groups? Or is it more simply about income equality and should there therefore be a, 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 a strong debate here about whether there should be a universal basic income for some in the community or sh we should increase uh, social welfare benefits what are your what are your investigations point to well good question in february this year i produced a report the marmot review 10 years on so i did a review in 2010 trying to answer your question, what are the causes of these inequalities? And we identified six areas, early childhood, second, education and lifelong learning, third, employment and working conditions, fourth, having enough money to live on, the fifth was healthy and sustainable places to live and work, and the sixth was behaviours, but inequalities in smoking, diet, alcohol and the like. Ten years on, when health of the population had more or less stopped improving in the UK and inequalities had continued to get bigger, in the first five of those, we found that things had got worse. And it very much related to public policy. For example, in 2010, 42% of GDP was spent on public expenditure. And that, as a result of government policy, went from 42% to 35%. And that reduction was done in a very regressive way. So that the, as a result of tax and benefit changes, families with children got progressively worse off the lower their income to begin with. People living in deprived areas, in the most deprived 20% of areas, public expenditure went down by 32%, and in the least deprived, it went down by 16%. So in answer to your question, yes, having enough money is vital, and we've seen a form of universal basic income instituted in the UK with the furlough scheme. It's the government being the payer of last resort. It's kind of UBI. So having enough money is crucial, but it's not the only thing, because those six domains that I just identified are all key to inequalities in health. Right, Professor, can I just uh, get your attention to the protests that we've seen on the streets, uh, Black Lives Matter protests sweeping across from the UK, the United States, other countries across the world. If you look at the US example in particular, you've had rising income inequality also a huge hit from COVID-19, in addition to what we then witness on the streets uh, with police brutality. How much of this is down to just purely about a protest around uh, racial injustice with police brutality? And how much is it around the rest of the issues I've mentioned? 
you know, access to healthcare, the cost of healthcare, and also the income inequality issues? Well, in the US particularly, the issue of race and of socioeconomic disadvantage are closely linked. Uh, take Minneapolis, where um, the murder took place, uh, which sparked all of this. One economic indicator, in Minneapolis, 75% of white Americans own their house, 25% of black Americans own their house. Whatever economic indicator you look like, there are, you look at, there are huge black-white differences. So police brutality, I would say, is a symptom as much as a cause. The fact that police target black people selectively is part of a much wider targeting of black people and putting them at economic and social disadvantage. And uh, I'm not an expert on what's motivating the Black Lives Matter movement, but I would find it surprising if it were not the case that that economic and social disadvantage was playing a big role. Police brutality by itself is terribly important, but so is the economic and social disadvantage. And then in the US, different from the UK. In the UK, we do have a national health service free at the point of use. In the United States, they don't have that. And there's big disadvantage in access to health care. So, Michael, this is about corporate greed as much as anything else. And I want to lay down my foundations to my viewers. I am a, a capitalist through and through. But in the 1950s and 60s, it was not uncommon for a CEO in the S&P 500 to earn 20 times the median salary uh, of his or her workers. Nowadays, it is not uncommon to be around about 360 times, with the average salary of a CEO in the S&P around about $14 million, uh, the median salary for an employee being about $38,000, $40,000. So roughly three to 350 times that. The corporate system is broken. Greed has gone mad in the C-suite. And this is at the root of many of the problems, isn't it? Oh, it definitely is. And it's undemocratic. A few years ago, there was British Social Attitudes did a survey of British people. And they asked them what they thought the CEO of a FTSE 100 company earned and what an unskilled factory worker earned. And they thought the ratio was around 12 and as you've pointed out, it's around 350. So they had no idea how big it was. They thought it was around 12. And then people were asked, what do you think it should be? And they thought it should be around six. So the British population is not egalitarian. It, they don't believe that everybody should get the same pay. Uh, people should get rewarded for various things. But they think it's gone far too far. And they have no idea how big it is. They had no idea that 350. When Martin Wolf writes in the Financial Times that rentier capitalism is rigged, I think it's time to take note. I mean, capitalism seems to be the system that's delivered prosperity to most countries in the world. It works. Um, but when it's gone crazy like it has now, you get people out on the streets. It is unsustainable.